Well, good morning, people, friends and family. Hope you are doing well. Welcome to those of you online. Um, we trust you're going to have an awesome morning with us. Uh, for those of you that are back in the building, so good to see you. I invite you just to come and find your spot as we stand together and worship, and the team will lead us. But let's just stand and pray, and just invite God to, to just come and, and hang out with us, and engage with us, and us with Him. So Lord, we thank You for the, the privilege of, of meeting together, and gathering together, and just fellowshipping with one another and with You. And Lord, we ask that as we come to worship, Lord, that, that Your Holy Spirit would just come. And Lord, that we can just come and give of ourselves and give who we are and what we are to you this morning, Lord. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth. So thank you, God, that we, we can meet together again. And we just um, look forward to, to what you want to do with excitement this morning. So, so thank you, God. Amen. Thanks, guys. We 
welcome. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Oh, mighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul away. Oh, mighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise, Almighty God of love. We welcome in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul away. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this Every heart. Let every heart adore, let every soul away. Almighty God of love, you are come in this place. We welcome, Lord, we welcome you this morning. Praise Him, He is holy. 
Is love the rescuing Or infinitely sweet This great love that has redeemed Or infinitely sweet This love so rescuing Oh, how infinitely sweet This great love that has redeemed Yeah, so we just want to invite you to praise Him. We're going to take up an offering for, for missions and mercy, and it's just an extension of, of what we're singing as we just come to give to God of, of who we are and what we have and just say thank you, God. And we look to bless. We want to be God's hands and, and feet in our community. So we have some baskets in the front. Those of you that are at home and online, feel free to EFT. Um, we're just looking to meet needs in the community. So, Father, we thank you that we can come with joyful hearts. And we can praise you with our finances as well as our words. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, that as we continue to worship, Lord, may you just... Um, Bless our offering, Lord, the, the, the songs, our, our hearts, our finances, all aspects, Lord. May you be glorified and may we glorify you in every area this morning. So we come to praise you, God. We praise you this morning. Sing our infinitely. infinitely sweet this love so rescuing oh how infinitely sweet this love that has redeemed so as one we sing oh praise him oh praise He's holy, yeah, He's holy. Oh, praise. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. He's holy, He's holy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Behind lifted up, behind lifted up, behind lifted up. Jesus, it's you we glorify, it's you we're lifting high. Your name be glorified. Behind, behind lifted up. Behind lifted up, behind lifted up, Jesus, it's you we glorify, it's you we lift in high, your name be glorified, so hallelujah, hallelujah. You are worthy. 
the rain You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our praise. Cause you are worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all Cause from you are all things And to you are all things You deserve the glory You're worthy of it all you From you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. And from you are all. And to you are all things You deserve the glory One more time You are worthy of it all And from you are all things And to you are all So day and night, night and day, letting sin rise. Day and night, night and day, letting sin rise. Day and night, night and day, letting sin rise. Day and night, night and day, letting sin rise. Day and night. Night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. One more time. Day and night, night and day, let Day and night, night and day, let it sing. Cause you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. And from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Day and night. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, cause you're worthy. You're worthy of it all.
Yes, Lord, you're worthy of it all. Yeah, Lord, thank you just for the gift of being able to come and sit at your feet and worship you, Lord. Thank you for the goodness that you bring to our lives, Lord. And this morning we come to give you all praise, glory, and honor. Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Lord, we so need your presence. We so need your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you're here. And I pray, Lord, that as we we just continue to to be in this place of connecting with you, in fellowship with you and with one another, Lord, that you would continue to, to speak into our hearts and our lives, Lord, not only for those of us that are here, but those at home as well, that your spirit would just speak words of life where there is desert, Lord. refreshing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. So before we do any announcements and stuff, John and Violet, it's your wedding anniversary today, correct? So, Guys, why don't we reach out our hands and let's just bless, bless John and Violet. Lord, we thank you for John and Violet. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in their lives. I thank you for what they carry and who they are. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done. And we want to pray a special blessing upon them, Lord, as they continue to serve you and look to be a blessing in their community, God. And I pray that you would just give more of your grace, more of your presence on their lives and in their marriage together. And Lord, may they be, uh, continue to be incredible examples to their community and impact people's hearts and lives. So thank you, Lord, for them. We bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. So welcome to all of you. It's so good to be back in a little bit of, um, as we hopefully we'll continue to expand from the 50, but it's good. And want to welcome any guests with us. 
uh, for the first time, and we'd love to bless you with a lovely cup of cappuccino or a drink. So please feel free to meet us at the back at the coffee shop after the service, and um, yeah, we would just love to, to get to know you a little bit and see how we can serve you and get to know you a little bit. The Burning Bush series will continue this week, Wednesday, and Lindiwe will be sharing um, on her story and calling. That's uh, from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, and we invite, uh, we've obviously got space for 50 here, um, but also we invite you in your house churches and your house groups or, or different family groups to tune in between 7 and 8, and listen, you can find it on Vineyard South Africa Facebook page and take a listen. It's really, really been a been an awesome series, the first one, and Steve shared on, on Wednesday, and it's really, really good stuff. Dave will be running a New Lands course um, on three alternate Sundays, and that will be starting on the 15th of August from 4 o'clock to 6.30. And um, this course, Dave says, will be helpful to all those who attended the Fresh Bread um, course a couple of, um, well, months ago now. But also for anyone else who wants to grow in their intimacy with the Father um, and looking for direction in their lives. The cost of the course is 60 Rand, and feel free to call the church office if you would like to attend. Then, very exciting, over the next three months, Blessing will be um, running, um, which obviously starts today. He's starting Revival Prayer. Uh, the initiative that he began last year. So it's for August, September, and October, starting today. He'll be um, praying at the, at the crosses, and he's inviting all sorts of groups and areas, and it's um, Joan Keeling from the, from, from the city, Nelson Mandela Bay, is also um, on board with us, and he's, we're expanding it this year. We really want it to be a, a, a citywide initiative, but he's inviting all of us, so house churches on a, on a Tuesday and a Wednesday and different ministries to come and join in. Um, on Saturdays and Sundays, it's from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock, and Mondays to Fridays from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. So really want to invite you and encourage you um, to come and join them. Um, it's there every day. Um, come and support and just pray. We need to be praying for revival in our nation in this time. So as Christians, let's, let's be praying for God. And then save the date for our Vineyard National Conference, which will be held from the 16th to the 19th of September here at Fountain Vineyard. Um, we'll be giving you more information as we get closer to it, and obviously as we know more and more about what's happening with COVID at that time. But um, we've got some exciting speakers lined up, and Dave can obviously share more on that as time comes on. So our thoughts over the Many of us have been away for a few weeks because we've been in lockdown, et cetera, et cetera, and holidays and everything else. So I just want to share some photos of different things that the church has been, been doing. And obviously, East Wing is one of them. Um, so you can just keep strolling. These are a couple of photos of what the East Wing's looking like. Feel free to walk up there and have a look. Um, the guys are doing an awesome job. And then the next is the soccer field. We've got a soccer field that's that's gone there. Now. Some good goalposts and... The volleyball court as well. Someone's um, laying a full-on proper volleyball court. The, it's going to be really, really professional and, and good stuff. And uh, we've actually put floodlights up as well for the young guys to, to get involved. Like They can play pretty much all hours of the day, except in curfew. And then um, Retrade, um, it's exciting. They started building um, earlier this month as well. So the containers are going to be turned into this amazing building through what voters are going to be doing over there. So we look forward to, to what that's going to, to look like. And then Mission Vale, um, voters involved there with timber with his church plant as well. So those are some photos of a structure and building that's going up. And um, it's very, very exciting, guys. Don't you think so? Yeah? Glad there's some excitement. And then obviously, McClarley and Sharon's house, the change of Richie and Kate, they shared a few weeks ago. They've had to do a whole lot of changes, and just look what they've done. Isn't that look amazing? So, guys, the kingdom is advancing, eh? and um, we're trying to impact the community, and different areas of the church are getting involved in different areas. There's no reason why the whole body cannot be involved in different areas across the city um, through what we, what we want to do. There's 
lots of vision and direction. And I want to encourage you, obviously we can't all gather at the same time, but we can all get involved in different areas, in smaller groups and different things at different times. So have a look, get involved, sign up and, you know, let's advance and let's take back any territory that the devil thinks he might want to take or has taken. Let's advance the kingdom. Let's take what is, what is God's and let's, let's, you know, uh, make a change and make lives, d- difference in people's lives. Uh, we can do that. Are you excited about that? Sure. I'll take it that it's muffled because you've got masks in front of you. Okay. So the last two things, just a reminder, all the information that you might need on small groups, uh, banking details, contact information, all that stuff is in the foyer. Feel free to help yourself. And if you get stuck, ask one of the staff. We can help you. And then please ensure that you keep your mask on at all times while in the building. Thank you so much. Dave. Every time I have this thing happen, I've got to all strip down to get it together. Uh, thanks, Liam, for leading our worship. And it is lovely to be together again. And, and before we go on into the Word, um, uh, just picking up on where Gav left off, I'd like to say um, <coughs> we, we are delighted in the, uh, the uh, activities and the calls that's on people's lives in, in this body to, to do so many different things. And, and there are three or four people I'd like to just call up quickly right now. Shady, why don't you come right here? Uh, Shady, Karen, you come up here. Timber's here somewhere. Timber, yeah? And Blessing, just want to uh, introduce them. Um, <coughs> where's the mic? Yeah, okay, there's the echo there, guys. Okay. Um, come on, Shady, you come first. So, so Shelly leads our children's ministry, as you all know, and for those at home, this is Shelly ha- uh, Hashik who leads our children's ministry, has done a really great job. I've asked each of these people to answer two questions to me this, this morning, just um, what do they envision, what are they excited about, what are they leading us to, and uh, what are the difficulties, secondly, f- to get from here to there, what, what help do they need to accomplish that? So Shelly, tell us about the children's ministry. Okay. Just step a little bit this way for the camera. That's way. There we go. It's so different, Dave. Right, good morning, everyone. Um, I love kids. I love kids' ministry, but I'm not such a fan of babysitting. And I want to explain the difference. The East Wing, the new building, is what I want to share about why my passion is kids' ministry versus babysitting and why we don't have 100 children just stuffed in a room at the back there because that's not kids' ministry. We don't want to just babysit children on a Sunday. We want to disciple children. So this new building is, is exactly what we're going to be able to need to do that because we were, we, were, we were busting at the sides. But we'll be able to, what my dream is to cater right from babies all the way till that sort of weird tweeny stage where they don't fit in life, you know what I mean? <laughs> so what, the aim for me is really to be able to create, there are, there are huge meeting rooms if you go and have a look. So some big spaces for big groups of children and some smaller rooms for discipleship rooms. So we're looking at anything from toddlers right up through all to the grade 9, 10 sort of age group. Um, So that's the one dream I have to get back into. I can just imagine, that's a big area. Can you imagine the noise and the balloons and the balls? And Dave, I can't wait. So that's what I'm looking forward to. So we, you know, that's one area. So the teen church is the new addition, I would add, with the new buildings. We've stopped at grade seven, but I'd love to go to grade nine or 10. And then the third area I'd love to um, start is a resource center for children. Books, a computer research station, um, puzzles, DVDs. Kids don't all have Wi-Fi. So it could be a, you know, there's a big dream that I have there. So that's what my... I have some dreams of kids' ministry, Friday night programs, Sunday morning programs, holiday programs. That's what that whole new building is going to enable us to do rather than being squished into that one loft at the top, which we've currently been doing over the last little while. That's the dream. Is this all the challenges? Yeah, go for it, go for it. Okay, so Dave asked me also to share the challenges. So here's the big one. We could start kids' ministry next week with all that will two weeks time maybe, once the carpets are in. The real problem I have is we don't have a volunteer team. That's the real problem. So we, we can't really cater for the number of kids at that venue 
can accommodate because I don't really have a volunteer team. COVID has done a really nasty thing in squishing those kind of things. And so I'm really praying that God would raise up a new volunteer team. We had 50 people involved in kids' ministry before COVID, and it dwindled down to about three. So that's impossible to run something that we're imagining, the church of this size and our building that we can accommodate. So I'm calling on people to, gifting from toddlers all the way through to grade nine. If that's your field or that's something you feel you could just, things like teaching, things like being there just to help with crowd control, Things like helping kids sign in on a Sunday morning. We've got a new whole foyer area. We need someone just to man the station. You don't have to even like really want to talk to children. You just have to talk to the parents. So that's one area. In terms of a resource center, we would need books and DVDs, perhaps an, a, a computer that's not being used, bean bags, pillows. Um, I'm going to go big here. We would love table tennis tables, foosball tables, um, good condition soccer balls and um, volleyballs. So because we've got a new building, we'd love some new stuff as well as the actual people help. So the dream is big, but I believe that if God's put a building there, we can fill it. Amen. Thank you, Shelly. Awesome. Let's give her a hand, eh? Thanks, Shelly, for what you're doing. Karen, you to come up here and talk to us about the Eden Life Center. Thanks. Good morning. Yeah, so I'm sharing about um, my passion, which is the Eden Life Center, and um, I really see it being able to to serve people in in four different areas. Um, I mean, many more, but but sort of focusing on a, the therapeutic side with counseling and um, individual and group um, support. And to me, it's just a basic human right that everybody should have access to mental health services. And so if we can help facilitate and, and be a support in the city, not only for the congregation, um, I just think it's an amazing opportunity. And then as well as giving people tools, so through equipping, through education, training, and courses, and then also through encounters with the Holy Spirit and encountering God and um, having opportunities for inner healing, whether it be through healing rooms or healing prayer, but specifically looking at um, the, the soul care and soul healing and then finding holistic help and holistic support. So connecting with the broader city and the resources that are already existing, um, that we can connect people with the right kind of, of care to meet their needs. and. I really just see Eden Life as being a, a central point for people to, to be able to find support and care in all areas of, of their lives. And so whether it's met here or whether it's through connecting through to other um, um, existing support in the city. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited about it. We obviously have lots of needs as well um, with resources and funding, but also bodies, people to help um, carry, carry the vision and support the vision, whether it be through getting involved in a volunteer capacity or bringing your gifts that you have or um, becoming part of the broader network um, that we are trying to establish to help people get connected. Great, yeah. Karen, thank you so much, awesome. Thank you, let's give her a hand as well, the Eden Love Center. Go on. Blessing, talk to us about the revival prayer. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, my vision is for revival. Uh, and our theme this year is the fervent prayer of a native church. We started last year, and I'm very excited to say that with participation uh, from many nations across, you know, across the world. So we continue this year uh, with those particular nations participating as well. But uh, our theme uh, for, for this year is to, you know, to have the churches in the metro coming to pray with us. So we are having many churches participating, coming to our church over the three months. This afternoon, we have got uh, Ali from Storehouse. They'll be coming to do worship. We've got Word of Faith and other churches. They'll be coming to, uh, you know, to pray with us. And we're also inviting the different ministries within the church to come to the crosses with your house, uh, with your house churches, uh, different ages of the youth and the Sunday school. So we want everyone to be involved with, uh, with prayer as... Uh, as we unite as the body of Christ. So I'm excited about it. So everyone should, should participate at least over the next three months. Be part of revival. It's not only here in Port Elizabeth. We've got, as I've already mentioned, uh, for people in Ireland, they started today. People in Australia, they're praying already. And uh, other churches are excited to be part of uh, this revival initiative. So come to the crosses. Uh, Monday to Friday, it is 5 to 6. And then uh, Saturdays and Sundays, it is 3 to 4. 
just one hour. Just come and uh, play with us. Thank you. Thanks, Blessing. Blessing. Give him a hand and encourage him as well, eh? Thank you, Blessing. Timber, tell us what's going on in Missionville. Good morning, church. Uh, the vision that we have in Missionville is to build uh, a kingdom-focused community. Because uh, what we uh, experience is that uh, there is a rare preaching of the word. People are more in culture and in uh, ancestral practices. So uh, one of the things that I saw becoming a challenge to us is that preaching the word has its own challenges. And the people of Missionville, yes, they do respond to the word when it's preached. Like uh, the previous uh, uh, outings we did, the taking the gospel to the streets, we've preached and we've seen quite a number of people responding to the word. So uh, what we are um, uh, looking forward to is to make sure that we do the proper follow-ups to those people and to see them coming through to church, to coming to serve God, praising God in all they can. Because what I've experienced as a challenge in Missionville, that I can say properly and hear right in front of the church, is that people, they tend to worship suffering. They tend to worship their pain. And yet they don't want to move forward as to go and to see or seek help from other people. But what I saw with the church plan that is in Missionville now is that it is a center where the people of Missionville will be relieved through the word, will be taught how to live their godly lives through the word instead of wasting and participating in stuff that doesn't even glorify God. So what I've experienced is to share with the people of Mission Vale what I've seen in my life because I've seen God in my suffering, I've seen God in my pain, and he took me through to that. But although it took years, but I've seen God in all those instances. So I'm blessed and I'm so happy. More especially, I'm here also to thank you as this bunch of people here for your prayers. What we need from the church is to pray more and more for Mission Vale. Intercede for Mission Vale. Don't even forget the name Mission Vale in your prayers. That's all I can say. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. Thanks, Timber. Give him a hand as well. Encourage him. Thank you, Timber. Thank you. Well, we're looking forward to the fruitfulness that will flow out of all those visions and, and callings. So let's get our Bibles out, guys. We're going to look into the Word this morning and uh, look into a question that is often asked of people, uh, like, who can really hear God? How do you know when God is speaking? Can I hear God? Uh, what would help me to hear God? Uh, and um, it's amazing how a word in season can be so refreshing. A, a word that you receive from the Lord can be transforming for your life. Eh? It is amazingly uh, restorative when we've heard from God in any particular area. Uh, I don't know about you, but some of my deepest struggles have were around the issue, what is God saying about this or about that? And until I'd heard from him, it, it remains in a place of flux and, and, uh, and uncertainty, and with that comes some insecurity and, and, and anxiety. But when I know I've heard from God, it just consolidates. It helps us to move forward. Huh? And his word is for us then a, a lamp for our path and a light for our feet. Huh? So it's good for us to think about uh, how can we hear God? And uh, we're doing a, a couple of weeks on that at the moment. I'd like you to go with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, uh, <clears throat> the uh, statements of Jesus about the uh, analogy of him being a shepherd. Um, and uh, we're going to pick up, he's talking about this to his disciples, and he, he talks about uh, the robbers and the, uh, the thieves. But here in verse 3 of John 10, he says, The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. This is a true shepherd. The sheep listen to his voice. They hear him. So one of the marks of a, a, a true sheep and a true shepherd is that you hear the voice of the shepherd. Every single Christian can actually hear God. You couldn't become a Christian without having heard from God. He called you. Hey? No one can come to me unless the Father calls him and draws him. So the fact that you, that you, can, that you can acknowledge his name and acknowledge his, his forgiveness in your life means that you have heard him at least once. Every single believer has heard God at least once to become a believer because faith comes by the hearing of God's word. So when we, when we say, I now believe, you can only get that by the revelation of the Spirit. In other words, you heard God. 
So this is what he says in verse, um, verse 3 to 5. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Don't you love that image? The shepherd is leading his sheep. Eh? He's not driving them. He's not, not obligating them. He's, he's leading them out. It's like a mother in a supermarket. It might be a bunch of, of kids all over the place, but she hears her own child crying in the other aisle. Eh? She knows that sound, and, and that child knows the mother's uh, response. There's that connectivity that happens in the relationship, and it's pretty much the same with the sheep and the shepherd. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. It has been said that the difference between David, uh, who became king to replace Saul, and Saul himself, was that Saul was the son of a donkey farmer, and donkey farmers drive their donkeys. <laughs> they chase them on. Uh, whereas shepherds, in Israel's analogy in particular, shepherds go in front of the sheep, and the sheep follow the shepherd. And you lead from the front, not from, from behind. And uh, this is what he's referring to here. He goes in front of them, and they follow him. But verse 5, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. I hope we're going to get an appetite to be more passionate about hearing from God. And God hasn't got laryngitis. That's an announcement we need to make today. God still has a voice, and he still speaks today. And the Bible says for us not to harden our hearts in the day when he speaks. That when he speaks, to lay hold of it and own it. In fact, the other scripture I want to take you to right now is Jeremiah 31 in the um, Old Testament, the uh, weeping prophet, as he's sometimes called, Jeremiah 31, uh, from verse 31 to 34, where uh, he prophesies about the, uh, the new covenant, the new season, the new testament that uh, eventually came, and we pick it up from Matthew's gospel onwards. But in verse 31 of Jeremiah 31, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the, the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant that I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. What a, what a powerful declaration of our, our heritage. They will all know me. Every single child of God is invited into that affirmed place of knowing that you hear God. Isn't that amazing, huh? You've, you've joined a species of humanity that actually hears God. We're a new humanity, and the difference in the new and the old is that the new hears God in all the ways he speaks. And he speaks in many circumstances, many ways, and through nature, through uh, revelations, uh, impressions that come to us through, through expounding of the word, and, and it triggers in our hearts, and sometimes through audible voices. Um, there are many, many ways God speaks to us, but you know his voice. You know his voice. I've got a number of specific ways that God has, has, has used to speak to me that uh, sometimes I feel are quite personalized. And, and you, it's like uh, when you're in love, huh? you, you have a, a particular language, uh, the lover and the beloved have a particular language that they understand. And it's with us and God in the same sort of way. But it, what it does for us, it adds meaning to our lives. When God has spoken, uh, when Colin and I were on this trip to up into the Northern Cape and Kalahari, and one of the things we did, we listened to a whole series while we were driving along um, by Viktor Frankl on man's search for meaning and how, how uh, man has struggled uh, without meaning. But once he finds meaning, once he finds a why, uh, he can endure any how. And, and, it's, and it's about the, the quest for the meaning, the quest for, for the why of things. And it's, it's a fascinating listen. But it made me think a little bit about um, a couple of people who, in history, and I've got some notes here on that, uh, who have questioned the meaning of life. Freddie Mercury, the lead singer in the rock group, The Queen, he had in, in his lyrics of his last uh, song on his album, Innuendo, he said, does anybody know what we are living for? And that's the, 
bass line of, of his song. Does anybody know what we are living for? And it felt like uh, that's what Freddie was crying out for. Um, <clears throat> Jonathan Gaby, a, a 31-year-old professional writer, um, facing employment challenges and stress when he hit rock bottom, began to ask questions about the meaning of life. He wrote, he wrote to people in all walks of life, uh, world leaders, the homeless, Oscar-winning actors, philosophers, comedians, taxi drivers, um, teachers, explorers, uh, even prisoners on death row uh, about this question, what's the meaning of life? And uh, to each one, he said, what is the meaning of life? And, and then he compiled a book with the, the results and the answers he got from people. Um, and here's just some of, the, some of the statements that were made by the varieties of people that he, he approached. Richard Nixon, you remember Watergate? Well, Richard Nixon said, life is one crisis after another. <laughs> you can appreciate that <laughs> in the trouble he was involved in in those scandal years. Eh? Uh, John Lennon said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. <laughs> it's like life's an accident. It just comes. Eh? Uh, Dennis the Menace said, life is what you make it, and I can make it unbearable. <laughs> yeah. Albert Einstein said, the man who regards his life and that of his fellow creatures as meaningless is not merely unhappy, but hardly fit for life. Graham Kentfield, who was the uh, chief cashier of the Bank of England, he, his, his signature was on all the, uh, the, the, the banknotes in the UK. He said, I'm clear that the meaning of life can only be properly understood in the context of our relationship with God. So we need to hear from him. We need to hear from God. That's where uh, the meaning of life begins to crystallize, become clear, and, uh, and, and shape up in significant ways for us. And we need to, to hear God. We need to discern between his voice and the, the many, many other voices that clamor for our attention and our devotion. Voices like our culture, uh, our traditions, what we are used to. Uh, social norms and social pressure and with social media rampant in these days, that's a big one. Huh? It's a very, very big one. Uh, even the voices of fear. Uh, it, uh, it's been said, how many can remember playing that game, uh, Tok Toki, where you run and knock on doors and you run away before they, <laughs> you remember that, uh, you knock and you run away before they, they open and no one's there. Well, it's been said that fear plays Tok Toki, fear knocks. But when faith opens the door, there's no one there. Okay? There's just something about faith that dispels fear. And I'm not talking about faith in faith. I'm talking about faith in the love of God. When you know his love and you're committing yourself to engage with his love, fear begins to recede. That's been my journey. The more I've said yes uh, to a, a faith relation with the love of God, the, the more fear, anxiety, insecurity has, has been and continues to recede in my life. Is anyone in this house or online that can relate to that? Eh? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Eh? Yeah. Uh, and even the voices of Google, hey, I'm, I, I think a lot about that in these days when there's so many uh, conflicting views and opinions and about COVID itself and about now about vaccines and should we, shouldn't we, and, and, uh, and so many pseudoscientists that are raised up and opinion polls in Google and all sorts of things. And quite frankly, if, we, if we're going to really enter into the immunology debate uh, intelligently, we would all have to study for at least 20 years. And, and yet we, we find people coming forward as experts <laughs> after they've just seen one post on Google somewhere, you know. Uh, I think we're going to get some reality. I think the other thing that's concerning me, if I can just touch this, because I think God wants to speak into the confusions and the angst of this issue. The other thing about it is that... Um, uh, he, he, he wants us to know that uh, he, he is to be the center of our lives and he is to be the reason we can be united with others, not our agreement on other things, secondary things, including things as important as our response to COVID, whether we should have vaccinations or not. I think it's horrific, it'll be demonic if you find yourself disdaining or being divided from a brother or a sister because you stand on the opposite side on this debate. I think the, d the devil wants to divide churches, divide families, and I've heard that I've, over the weeks, and increasingly so. I've even had families being divided over, over these issues, uh, and I think that's a demonic ploy. 
Uh, the, the devil um, wants to keep us divided, but Jesus brings us together. And if we're trusting him, uh, when I thought about this, and the, the Lord put Mark 16 in my mind, it says and, uh, about the, 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 the days of our discipling, uh, when we just are involved in these things, we'll drink deadly poison and will not harm them. So even if I'm consuming something that is toxic, I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to trust my cleverness. My cleverness is not what's going to save me. So I want to encourage some, some, some sense, some, some grounded wisdom, and work with the thing more logically, and don't be swayed by the opinions of many, many people, and even, even amongst us in Fountain Vineyard. Uh, and I want to declare that if anyone absents or stays away or disdains and di- brings division over the issue like vaccination or any attitude towards COVID, you will, have, you will have fallen into a demonic trap. And I'm saying it to those even that are at home as well. That God's purpose for us is to walk in unity. When Jesus prayed that last prayer, remember John 17, the big prayer of his life, and it, was his, it was his biggest prayer. Uh, and this is what he prayed, Father, that they may be one. If that's the passion of our Lord, then what are we doing playing around with putting the unity that we have in Christ at risk over opinions about secondary things? And they might be important. They are important, but they're not as important as our unity in Christ. In heaven one day, you won't have to produce your vaccination card or have to, or have to despise it or have a, your opinion about it uh, uh, interrogated. It's not about that. The only question will be, did you trust and love Jesus and follow him? That's the question. Does that make sense? I want to say even on these issues, let's be sure we're hearing God. People say to me, Dave, why don't you just... Tell us what to do. <laughs> I say, pray about it. Ask God. But I'm, I'm quite happy to give you my opinion about this thing. I'm quite happy to do it. But in no way is that opinion meant to divide you from your brother or your sister or from me. If that happens, then you've been demonized. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get a revelation from God. And we run with a fixation on that, and it's good, but it's, what it does for us sometimes, it blinds us to the bigger picture. And unfortunately, that brings great pain and hardship. I, I think of, I've often reflected on this. Martin Luther has this revelation um, of justification by faith, and he, it results in him uh, writing the 95 Theses on the church door of Wittenberg, and, uh, and he starts the Reformation, basically based on this thing that he saw, that we are justified by faith and not by indulgences and and religious rites and and practices. We are justified by faith in Christ. And and that became the cornerstone. And yet, Luther, if you you know, he didn't allow the revelation of what God was saying to him to impact other areas of his life, like, for instance, his anti-Semitism. I mean, it's horrific to think that Luther and therefore Lutheranism gave rise to Hitler and Nazism. I mean, it's horrific. We, we really have to understand that we, what we are seeing is one part of the truth. Let's get the full picture. Hey? I mean, if we were looking at an elephant and standing at different sides and describing what we saw, you'd have about 100 different pictures, wouldn't you? But we put that all together, we get the thing in perspective. So let's be sure that when we're hearing from God, we hear it in the context of, of a community confirmation as well and a wider breadth of things. Ulrich uh, Zwingli, a a Reformation pastor and theologian, he, listen to this, he condoned the torture and the drowning of Anabaptists, those who have been baptized now as believers, you know, in uh, in response to their personal faith, as opposed to the the christening that they used to do, uh, and still do in some churches. And Zwingli, I mean, he took took a, a stance of actually, capturing these Anabaptists and having them tortured and, and oftentimes drowned because of their different theological view on a church right. That's crazy, hey? This is absolutely crazy. I also think, just go back to Luther, one other thing that strikes me, although he saw that we are justified by faith, yet when it came to the priesthood of all believers, he still maintained clericalism that there's a a clergy and a laity distinction, and you need to have ordained priests for the priesthood. That's just crazy. We all get to play. 
And the revelation of that we're all justified before God puts us all right that we can access his throne of grace boldly, every one of us. Hey? Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, great reformers, great re revivalist preachers in the 19th century, in the Great Awakening, as it was called, particularly in America, they were both, actually, listen to this, slaveholders. They practiced ongoing slavery while they proclaimed the Great Awakening. Go on. Can't you see how essential it is that we hold our truth in community with others and the more of the truth that we receive from them, lest we live narrow, tight little lives. And you know what? We see churches and families, nations being divided over the most trivial issues. If only we could see the thing in broad context and hear God more broadly, we would have such a happier time, hey? Huh? There are many, many other leaders we've had many in our, in our times, in our generations, uh, uh, like, for instance, in the Protestant missionary movements that have come all over the, the globe, um, and many contemporary evangelical leaders and charismatic leaders that have had failed marriages and uh, failed family life uh, and uh, illicit sexuality. Um, in fact, and I'm very grateful for my uh, Wesleyan roots uh, but John Wesley himself was, was one of many, many children. But, and when he married, uh, he, uh, uh, he had a very unhappy marriage, as it turned out. Uh, it's, it's been said uh, that he couldn't live with his wife. So he, he was so grateful for his call to an itinerant ministry. <laughs> he, he spent more time on his horse. They say he's traveled like, I don't know, 50,000 or something miles or something on horseback. And he had, he had a desk actually on his saddle that he could actually, most of his writings were done while he was riding. Um, and... Um, <laughs> but, but he never, never resolved the tensions in his marriage. Hey? We've got to hear God about the important things. Hey? Uh, in fact, how many of you come from the Pentecostal traditions in the background? You remember the Azusa Street Revival in 1906 down in California and um, in Los Angeles? Uh, it was in its earliest seasons terribly split, although they got the revelation and heard from God about the power of the Holy Spirit, they did not get the revelation that this would be a uniting of humankind across the table, and they were split on race lines. Racism was rampant in Pentecostalism, and it's continued so to be for probably a hundred some years. There are many, many contexts where uh, uh, Pentecostals have still carried the legacy that they were born in into 1906, if that makes sense to what I'm saying. We've really got to hear God in a way that, that we bring it, your piece of the puzzle and my piece of the puzzle, we bring it all together and we get a broader perspective. Remain teachable, hey? Remain teachable. So let, me, let me go to something else. In Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul says this, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. And, and Paul wasn't saying, you know, I am Christ. He's saying, I'm seeking to, to, to live his, his life and he in me. And, and, uh, and as much of him as you can see in me, would you follow that? Would you follow that? And if there are parts of my life that do not reflect him, uh, now this is the paraphrase I would be hearing Paul add on. If there are parts of my life that do not reflect Christ, please have the wisdom, the discernment to set that aside. Don't become like the saint I'm, I, I'm reaching to be in God, but reject the idiot in me, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you ever, does anyone else have an idiot in them? <laughs> okay. Oh, dear. You know, here's what this will mean for us, uh, if we, if we get, us, get this right. It, uh, it, would, it would challenge uh, the very heart uh, of what we're driving uh, and, and aiming to achieve and become as churches. You, you have a modern-day churchianity perspective, and this is how the dynamics of that works. You, you gather, so marketing is important. Gathering is the most important thing. You want to gather, reach, and gather. So it starts wide, as wide as possible. And then, uh, then you, as you gather, you try and connect them. And that's not a bad thing. These are good things. You connect people. And as you connect them, you, you move on to equipping them. And as you equip them, you, you, you help discern calling. And so the, the funnel comes down. 
comes down from a wide gathering to connecting and then to equipping and then to calling. And because the funnel is now narrow, as many as are called are able to drop fresh water onto a thirsty world that spreads out beneath the funnel. But it's just drop by drop. And yet, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, Habakkuk 2, 14, says that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. He's saying God's plan is for the earth to be saturated with the knowledge of God. And, and so Jesus has a different model for that. He doesn't start with this wide funnel. He starts with a narrow funnel. In fact, he starts in the desert. Eh? And I know we, Colin and I just come back from the time up in, in, in the desert areas of uh, Western South Africa. And um, we just love the desert. We love the pastoral colors. We love the serenity and solitude. And, and, and the air is so clean, eh? It's just, and the people are lovely. We just, we love going to the desert places. And so I'm not surprised that uh, many, many people find the times in the desert very rejuvenating. Uh, sometimes the desert is forced on you like Moses, 40 years, eh? <laughs> uh, Elijah, he came into his desert place on his, on his flight from, from Jezebel. Uh, John the Baptist, uh, eating his locusts and honey in the desert as he prepared for his ministry as a prelude to the breaking in of Christ the Messiah. But desert, desert experiences are often good for us. So um, we, we come from, from that, and, and I'm thinking about uh, Jesus also in Luke 4 in the desert, uh, 40 days, and, and a time of, of reflection and testing, and, and he does battle with the temptations of his life uh, and the things that God is preparing him through these tests for the, uh, the, the ministry challenges. And it does speak to us about before you can be trusted with ministry, you need to be tested with desert. Often testing precedes, precedes trusting. So don't despise the desert you might be in. It's maybe the very thing that God is using to test you and prepare you to be a trusted servant, a trusted son in the house. So the model of Jesus doesn't start wide, like I said just now, in the churchianity strategy. It starts narrow. It's Jesus, born of a virgin Mary, raised in a simple uh, Nazarene village, uh, Nazareth, and he's a son of a carpenter, takes over the business when his dad, who was elderly, dies. And, um, and, and, and then he, he starts his ministry by just choosing a couple of close disciples, Peter, James, and John. And, and, and another, another nine on top of that. So there's three, there's and in, in the three, in fact, there's still one, John. He spends more time with John. And, and then there's the, 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 the 12 that he, he spends time with, uh, much time over there, and he's often engaging them. Then there's the, the 12 along with the 70 that he sends out. And so can you see this funnel is coming like this now? It's getting wider. And then there's the 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, eh? And then there's the 500 that he pierced in one of his resurrection appearances. So, so the funnel is getting wider and wider of people who've caught the, the passion and the significance of hearing God. Because that's what it all comes down to. And, uh, and in the end, you've got this huge funnel that's opened outwards. And, and the earth is being flooded with the knowledge of the glory of God like the waters cover the sea. And so what I'm saying to you... It's a plea for us to take much more seriously than we've ever taken before the call to become disciple makers, disciples, if you like, to disciple others. And this is not where we hire somebody to do it. This is not for the, the few on the professional funnel. This is for all of us. Every one of us has been called by Jesus to make disciples in, in all nations. Every one of us has this amazing call. And, and the heart of a disciple, you might say, well, what's discipling all about? The heart of, dis of a disciple is that you, because it's the same word Jesus used for follower, my sheep follow me, it, uh, they're disciples by me. A follower and a disciple is the same thing. And now what's the, what is it about a sheep? He, he hears the, the shepherd's voice. So the main thing about discipling is helping people to hear God. If you can help people to hear God as they interpret the complexities of their lives, they begin to do life differently and they become transformed. What you don't want to do is hire somebody to hear God for you and you never hear for yourself. That's, a, that's a backward parenting, if you know what I'm saying, of those who've got kids. You, you don't want to do it all for them. You need to bring them to a place where they need to own the call of God in their life. Now, God wants to speak to us and 
and help us, um, uh, help us do this thing very, very differently. So y- here's some, some uh, implications of that. This is what it would look like for us. And by the way, that's why I'm going to run this New Lens event. It's just one of those things I want to do some more reflecting about helping people to hear from God. And it's a, a spirituality-based uh, invitation to uh, clarify how we hear God. So come on that New Lands event that uh, Gavin was talking about a little earlier. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, seven, seven uh, implications of this for um, healthy discipleship, for example, would be, be before you do. Your being is more important than your doing. Because in the first model, uh, there's it's a lot of emphasis on doing. But in this model of discipling, following Jesus, who you are with Him is so much more important. And then secondly, um, and I've been very helped by Peter Scazzaro, who wrote a book along these lines as well. Follow the crucified Christ, not the Americanized or the televised or the uh, ce- celebrity Christ. Uh, follow the crucified Christ. And th- that's part of our discipleship is, is learning to follow the crucified Christ. And, and when you struggle with some temptation, some tendency in your life, whether that might be some sexual issue, it might be a tendency towards aggression or, or uh, anger, uh, it, it might be a, a tendency towards fear, whatever your, your, your go-to thing is for the bent of your soul, when you, <coughs> when you follow the crucified Christ, what you do is, is uh, Andy Kamiski, who originated the Living Waters Ministry, said when he was asked what he does when he feels tempted sexually, he says, I've learned to run quickly to the cross. That's following the, America, the, the crucified Christ. Learn to run quickly to the cross. And then thirdly, embracing God's gift of limits. So I know I'm not meant to disciple everybody in Port Elizabeth. Not at all. I'm meant to disciple a number of people who are themselves a disciple of a number of others who are themselves a disciple of a number of others and the funnel gets bigger. And the people of Port Elizabeth or Kabecha get discipled. Does that make sense? What a, what a privilege we have to be part of a much better adventure than just keep hiring professionals, if you know what I'm saying. Eh? Uh, number four, he says, discover the, the treasures hidden in grief and loss. Work with your losses. Look, work with your grie- griefs. Because somehow in the brokenness of that, we discover the gains of God and His, and his, and his goodness to us. So we, we grieve not as those who, who have no hope. And then he says, make love the measure of spiritual maturity, how you can love others, not theological correctness or prowess concerning capacities, uh, but your love for others. How well can you love others? Now, that's where even the idiot in us can rise up because it doesn't take rocket science to be a lover. Eh? I'm so glad for that. I told you guys previously a couple of weeks ago, I feel like if I, if I look at the stages of my life, I've, I'm, I, I broadly speaking, God's divided into three stages for me. I was an adventurer. Uh, we still embrace some of that. That's good. Um, and, uh, and then I became a, a contender, a warrior. I contended for things uh, for 30 years. And uh, I feel I'm in that season now where he's calling me to be a lover. And I'm so glad because you, you can be very simple when you love. Hey? <laughs> Loving requires patience. It requires empathy. It requires being there. It doesn't require you having all the answers. Hey? Love does require you to be truthful. So like when I say people who bring division over secondary things like the jab or not to jab, uh, that's demonic. And doesn't take rocket science to see that either. That's a statement of a simple idiot. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not calling you idiot, so just don't get it again. I'm speaking to the simplicity of our faith. Eh? And then um, here's the other thing you can do to bring about healthy uh, emotional discipleship. Break the power of the past. Don't be trapped. Don't let your future be ransomed, held to ransom by the history that you have. Whatever past has gone down, uh, don't let that hold you. And then lead out of weakness and vulnerability because, you know, we, we, the humble will, uh, he says, draw, draw to God in humility and he will draw near to you. The meek will I show my way, he says, Scripture says that over and over again. Um, so you might be saying, Dave, okay, help me, help me land. What can I actually do as a result of this message today? Can I give you four things you can do? Yes, number one, you can make a decision. You can make a decision to go all out and follow Jesus. When Jesus comes to Matthew's table and he says, follow me, Matthew momentarily must decide, do I continue working at this desk with this stuff here, serving another master, or do I leave this desk? 
He has to make a decision. Discipleship starts with a decision. But here's our big mistake. You know, when we think that discipleship is just about a decision, it's only the start. And when you've got decisions, they sign a decision card, it's only the beginning. It's not a Christian in the full sense, because Christian means a follower of the Christ. Has he begun to follow? He's decided to follow, but he hasn't yet begun to do it. Uh, and, and let me tell you something else. You can work with addition or multiplication. You know, if, just take a, an amazing evangelist who can, who can preach and bring a thousand people to Christ every day. A thousand. That's 365,000 in a year. Who'd like to have that kind of track record, eh? And then what he does, the next year, he does it again. And he reads another, another 365. So he's got 730,000 converts, decisions, in two years. If you continue adding on 1,000 a day, 1,000 a day, by, by year 25, this guy in his ministry has led 9.125 million people to Christ. And by year 27, he's, read, he's led 9.859 people to Christ. 9.8 million people. Compare that with the Jesus model. In year one, at the end of the year, he's led one person. He's a disciple, one person to hear God, to walk the life of a disciple. By year two, he and the one he led in the first year have each led another one. So by end of year two, there's four. If you continue the same in comparison by year 25, this guy in the, in the discipling model, they have landed on 33.5 million. It's in year 25. And by year 27, it's just two years later, it's moved to 134 million people. Coming through on the basis of the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God. Isn't that amazing? That's why we need to have every single person in Fountain Vineyard becoming a discipler of others. But before you can become a discipler of others, make a decision to be a good disciple yourself. Does that make sense? You can't lead others where you yourself are not going. So the second thing you can do, and, and by the way, 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 is a good verse for your fridge this week. And it's a reminder of the call for decision. The, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. So you need to make a decision for Christ. He's looking out for those who've made that decision. Second thing is feel your feelings. Get in touch with your humanity. As I say, we're not trying to raise up people who are theological uh, professionals. We're asking for people who are disciples, and you need to know your humanity, so feel it. And one of the things that helps you to, to be in touch with that is to ask uh, questions, the why questions. Why did I feel so angry about that? Why did I feel so insecure about that? Where did that come from? And ask the why questions, and ask them of yourself before God, but ask them also in the context of a trusting relationship with one or two friends. So help me to see this. I'm not sure if I'm seeing something, if I'm missing something here. But ask the why questions. And it is so healthy to deal with your, your feelings. Feelings are like the, the dash lights on, the, on your car. Huh? When the lights come on, they come on for a reason. Don't just put, put a duct tape over the light and say you can ignore it. It's probably going to cook your motor. So same when there's something that you feel, it's an indicator that something's going on in your life. Where does this come from? It's not necessarily all bad, but it originates somewhere. So get in touch with your feelings. I know some people uh, often get rebuked for talking about uh, ad adversity, vulnerability, brokenness, feelings. But it's actually a key to healthy discipleship. We grow up before we grow old if we work with our feelings. I know some older people who are so out of touch with their feelings, they actually might be 70 years in the shade and actually still about seven or eight years old. In terms of development, their EQ is rock bottom still. And the third thing you can do to help, uh, help this happen is silence. Be silent and enjoy silence. Go on silent retreats. Colin and I did a two-week, listen to this, two weeks silent retreat in, uh, uh, with a group in, in, in uh, Maryland, Washington, outside of Washington, D.C. Two weeks of silence. And... Uh, once a day, the leader of this retreat, we has, he speaks to the group for 40 minutes. That's the only conversation. That is, and it's one way. It's monological. So <laughs> you can't respond. And you've got to take your questions and your responses to God. But silence is so good. We need to learn to embrace silence. 
and the solitude that often it, it invites. Um, the Desert Fathers discovered that in about 250. Anthony was one of the first Desert Fathers. These are, these are men and women that, because uh, they became fathers and mothers, uh, that um, uh, quested a spirituality that is more based on our being than our doing. And uh, it led to some amazing uh, depth in development of sp uh, spirituality. And in the silence, what's happening is that you're letting go. And, and you're letting God. Watch out for the, the devil's trap to make you want to surf the net on your, quiet, on your phone silently while you're in silence. That's not silence. There's intrusion happening. Google's getting in on you. Uh, social media's getting in on you. Um, in silence, the divine archaeologist begins to dig into the, the ruins and recesses of your life and discover things there that will be very helpful for you in terms of self-understanding and redefinition for the way forward. And we've been saying that this whole lockdown thing has been a reset time. It's time we let the, the divine archaeologists dig deeper. Okay? So decide, feel, be silent, and lastly, commune. Commune with God. Do life in conversation with Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says that pray without ceasing. Praying without ceasing, by the way, is not us just telling God, it's us listening to God. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, allowing him to speak to us. And there's something so special about um, the hearing from God in, in, that, in that sense. Just uh, uh, yesterday I did it again, but just to find time to go sit in your, in your cave, whatever that might be. The Russian Christians call it a pustinia. You need a, a special place that you and God have an appointment to meet in, whether it's a, uh, a certain chair in your house or on a bench in your garden or it might, wherever it might be, but a place that you have a, as an encounter with God. And find that place. Make it. Go and sit somewhere. I used to sit in the golf course in, when I lived in Newton Park uh, in First Avenue around there in the golf course. That was my place until I, we moved and I found this cave and that's where I go now and, and, and uh, commune with God. And then coming out of that, it's much easier to, to do life in conversation with Him ongoingly because you've had that connection. Huh? Does that make sense, guys? So... Let's decide, let's feel, let's be silent, and let's commune. These things will help us begin to move forward in um, being disciples and making disciples. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the call that um, you are issuing to us like you did to those early men and women. Come, follow me. And I feel like you're calling us here in Fountain Vineyard and in the Vineyard Church in South Africa. And glad for those that are listening in today um, from Peru and all over the globe, places. Lord, thank you that you're calling every one of us into this new covenant-based relationship with you where we hear from you, we commune with you, and we allow you to change us and we become part of a new humanity. And I want to pray for those especially who have been uh, disillusioned and perhaps abused and damaged by destructive ways of doing church. Where the emphasis was on things that do not really make for maturity, but make for control. Lord, we want to be part of that humanity that fills the earth with the knowledge of who you are as the waters cover the sea. We want, to be, we want to be part of that. So I pray, Lord, that everyone who hears this message today would have a rising passion in their hearts to say yes to the call, to be a disciple and to make disciples of others. That this wouldn't be just left to a few fringe people, but this would be a call that every one of us rises up to and says, thank you, Lord. And heal us, Lord, where we have been distorted and broken in our understanding of these things. And give us a fresh perspective that comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to pray for anybody who would like prayer. Especially, I feel like today, and you might be at home listening. It might be someone that's here. We've got someone on the veranda here as well. And, um, if you have uh, had some negative experiences of discipling, 
There was a movement called the shepherding movement or discipling movement, which had a controlling dynamic in it, where those who disciple others control them. That's not what we're on about. That's abusive. We're talking about each one knowing God. If you've come out of some abusive spirituality and some abusive discipling experience, we'd like to pray for you to be set free from that and to be raised in God for a, a new day. And if you're at home, we'd love to hear from you. Just drop us a line. We'd pray for you specifically. We, as you heard Blessing say, we're going to have people praying every single day over the next three months. We'd love to pray for a revival of disciple-making across the globe. All the Lord's people said, amen. Thanks for listening, guys at home and anywhere else. Bless you all. If you'd like prayer, anyone that's here this morning about things we've been talking about, I'd love you to come forward. I'd love to just pray with you and release a fresh anointing in your